This is CBC Here and Now. We chose the uh, type of wine to buy, the quantity of wine, and who we were buying it from. Millions spent on fine French wines that the NLC can't even sell. Former CEO under investigation. See the destruction the sea did with the sea fence there. You can only imagine if there were no sea fence there. Pieces of sea wall designed to protect the town of Bonavista are now just littering the streets. Good evening. A bombshell report from the Auditor General tonight. The Liquor Corporation is sitting on millions of dollars of wine it can't sell. Wine that the former CEO arranged to buy from his son. The report also finds illegal wine shipments as well. Here now is Peter Cowan is live tonight with the details. So Peter, what, what's happening here? Anthony, there's a lot to break down in this report, but it was focusing on the fine wines program. These are wines that the NLC bought for hundreds, sometimes even thousands of dollars a bottle. Much of it now is sitting there unsold. It's a program that was bought in, brought in by the former CEO without any business case, and it's a program that he was running personally. This was Mr. Winter's program. Uh, merchandising was not involved in that whatsoever. Uh, he chose the uh, type of wine to buy, the quantity of wine, and who he was buying it from. These are wines that were bought from Bordeaux, some of the most expensive and rarest wines produced. His son was acting as an agent for some of these wineries, and the father ended up buying four and a half million dollars of wine through his son. That's almost a third of the wine purchased through this program, more than any other agent. In an email about buying a product, his son wrote, you know I sell it, right? To which Winter wrote back, I do, that's why I ordered it. In another instance, the CEO put in a rush order for 96 bottles of wine. The list price, $539 a bottle. His son collected a commission of $2,000 on that sale. To date, only four of those bottles have been sold. Was this a con? In this particular instance, uh, the adult child would not have been dependent and or living in the, in the household with, the, uh, with Mr. Winter, so uh, it's not technically caught. <laughs> so it's just a, a, it's a technicality. As you can see there, the Auditor General is saying that when it comes to the rules, it may not have technically been breaking provincial rules, although today the finance minister did say that it was breaking NLC's own guidelines when it comes to how to deal with family members. What Steve Winter is saying about this? Well, he wouldn't do an interview with CBC, but he did give us a statement, and here's part of what it said. He wrote, this is about taking a run at my son's business. This talk of nepotism is off base. I didn't break any rules, and if the legislation is no good, that's not my fault. So what about all the wine? Well, much of it, as we've been saying, is sitting unsold. The liquor store has now discounted much of it to try and sell it off. The latest figures we have show that there are still 23,000 bottles of wine sitting there, wine that cost the liquor store $3.8 million to buy. To try and get rid of the inventory, the liquor corporation has been discounting to sell it off. But in trying to sell it off, it's also been breaking the law. It's been shipping wine directly to buyers in other provinces they are supposed to go through that other province's liquor corporation. And all of that is now under review by the RNC. But what about the other part of it, buying his son's wine? Should that be reviewed by the police? Well, we asked Tom Osborne about that this afternoon, and he said that he is talking to Justice Department officials. They're reviewing this report, and they'll figure out next steps from there. You may remember that Steve Winter was fired by Osborne as the CEO of the liquor corporation and he was paid out because it was fired without cause. However, he is back in court in just a few days. He's suing the NLC for more money. Anthony? That's Peter Cowan reporting live from our newsroom. The mayor of Bonavista says his historic community is now vulnerable after last month's major storm. The town's seawall failed multiple times during that storm. John Norman says without a fix, properties are at risk. Here now's Garrett Barry takes us there. They say you gotta see it to really understand. I mean, people have been using the term repair in the media, but there's nothing to repair in most locations. Pieces of seawall meant to protect this town now lying on the side of the road or floating in the sea. Age takes its toll, uh, but the last couple of severe storms we've had, uh, of course, the most recent storm uh, was, was noteworthy. Uh, they've seen some damage, and then the most recent storm 
uh, complete failure and collapse. Battered by a historic storm. We saw storms as bad, but we didn't see the sea as bad. Uh, the sea has obviously gotten higher because the surge is like, like never before. Failures at six separate locations. And now, a big question. What happens next time? Three doors down, there's a, a lady that uh, is very, very vulnerable, and I know she's deeply concerned. Some of the oldest buildings in Bonavista Vista are the ones that are at risk. This is part of the Mock Beggar Plantation, a provincial historic site. And all of this is garbage, rocks, even wood from the sea that washed up during that January storm. It's not just buildings either. Just behind many of these seawalls are some of the town's main um, roads through residential neighborhoods. Under those roads are the main water and sewer lines to hundreds and hundreds of homes. The town is asking the federal government for cash. It says a fix could cost $10 million. But they've asked for meetings before, and this homeowner says the time for talk is over. It's a subject that uh, has been talked about since 2016, and uh, it's just been given lip service, and nothing really concrete has been put forth to, um, to help remedy the situation. The town isn't asking for a simple replacement. They want a whole new design because of rising seas and harsher storms. Bonavista has always been Bonavista by the sea, and the sea now is uh, too close. Garrett Berry, CBC News, Bonavista. Well, we've got a couple of things to talk about tonight. First is a cold front that's sweeping through. We're seeing some snow for parts of the island right now. That's going to eventually taper off as we head through the overnight. But the other thing I'm really watching is these cold temperatures up through Labrador uh, in behind that cold front. Actually, in fact, these cold temperatures extend all the way through Ontario uh, and even into the states uh, tonight. So we do have some uh, cooler temperatures on the horizon, certainly overnight tonight. This is where you'll be sitting in the morning. We've got some wind as well. So combined with these temperatures, when you walk out the door tomorrow morning is going to be cold uh, with those wind chills. So you're going to want to bundle up. I'll have those details and we'll look at the weekend forecast coming up. Thank you, Ashley. The province's consumer advocate says this week's rate mitigation announcement is a good start, but there's much more work to be done to determine how electricity costs can be kept under control before the Muskrat Falls switch is turned on. Here now is Terry Roberts reports. After four days of study and discussion, Dennis Brown is ready with his assessment. This is a work in progress but it is a good work in progress. Brown's job is to speak for electricity users and today expressed what many feel about the Muskrat Falls project. The words Muskrat Falls will be used for decades to come to warn of the dangers of political folly, extraordinary financial risk and implausible projects. And Brown is putting part of the blame for this fiasco on former Prime Minister Stephen Harper saying if he had not approved a federal loan guarantee, Muskrat would never have happened. It was an extraordinarily brazen move. Many people are still trying to make sense of what Monday's announcement really means. Will tearing up the original financing arrangement for Muskrat and replacing it with a so-called cost-of-service model keep rates affordable? Your rates will not go up as a result of Muskrat Falls. Brown won't go that far but is encouraged by Ottawa's willingness to rip up the original agreement and replace it with a more traditional formula that puts those dividends back into the pockets of ratepayers. But that formula will still leave a gap of nearly $5 billion in order to keep rates below 14 cents per kilowatt hour. That's why there is this uncertainty about numbers. They didn't give numbers because they couldn't give numbers. It's a scenario that worries credit rating agencies like Moody's. It says there remains a material risk that the province may have to directly or indirectly provide support to Nalcor to meet its electricity rate targets. Moody's is worried that because of what it calls Nalcor's weak financial metrics, the government may have to assume some of Nalcor's debt. Still, the consumer advocate has faith in the provincial team that is taking the case to Ottawa. They're on top of this file, and I think we can have confidence in them. Terry Roberts, CBC News, 
St. John's. It's terrible. No one actually drives the speed limit. No one pays attention to the yellow light. A car ran a red light and crashed into his motorcycle. So why did he have to go to traffic court? Police have charged a member of the Roman Catholic Church with sexual assault offenses from the 1990s in Badger. 62-year-old Anthony Hageman, known as Father Tony, is charged with four counts of sexual offenses against a seven-year-old child. He was serving with the Catholic Church at the time. He now lives in Toronto. The RCMP started investigating after receiving a complaint last August. The man will be in court in Grand Falls, Windsor next month. Well, postal workers held a lunchtime demonstration in St. John's to protest the way temporary workers are treated. Just how they were treated was exposed during last month's storm. Here now, Cease Hare was at the protest. The rally was organized by temporary workers at the postal station on Kenmount Road to bring attention to their plight. These workers have no stability for their families, so they can't get a drug plan, so if they need prescription drugs, physiotherapy, stuff like that, it's not available to them. Their frustration grew after the January storm. Temps, as they're known, didn't get paid during the state of emergency, despite normally working for 40, 30, 20 hours a week. Same job, standing side by side with my sister, working the same job, getting $10 <laughs> less there. Absolutely ridiculous. Sometimes we get 15 minutes to get here. I live in Pooch Cove. Good luck trying to get here in 15 minutes. Some of us live outside in like Petty Harbor. Same thing, 15 minute notice, and they will not give you any more notice than a half an hour most times. The solution, according to the union, is full-time jobs for the work they're getting done. We've done the calculations. There's 14 full-time jobs in temporary usage alone. There's a job and a half in overtime by full-time employees. Part-timers are using up to 25,000 hours a year. There are more jobs. Canada Post says it paid people during the state of emergency as per the collective agreement, and it says it's working with the union to try to improve the situation in the workplace. Cease Hare, CBC News, St. John's. Well, it's an experience that's dented one man's trust in drivers as well as the justice system. Gordon Little suffered serious injuries following a violent motorcycle crash last summer. Here now's Jerry Meaton has that story. Little was riding his bike when another driver ran a red light and struck him with his car. He suffered painful injuries, but that was just the start of an awful ordeal that's still dragging on. Lou and I sat down to chat about the crash, the aftermath, and how he, the victim, ended up in traffic court. Uh, a guy just blew what, through what he thought was the yellow and was not. He, he ran a red light and he T-boned me on the side and he ejected me and I flew through the air and then landed on my side and my entire body from neck to toe was just bruises on this side from both the impact and that I landed on that side. They did a ridiculously large battery of tests on me. They put me through a CAT scan and they did full body x-rays. They put me under for surgery and they put two plates in and about nine screws. What summer there was, was just me looking out the window, seeing the kids play out on the lawn. In the mail, I got a subpoena to go to court. And I, I opened it up and, and lo and behold, the, the guy who had run the red light and, and hit me, he was contesting his traffic ticket. It's not really well laid out because you're all just sitting there on these benches and then lo and behold, the guy who's contesting the ticket that hit me with his car is sitting three feet away from me, even though I didn't know it at the time. The very first thing the lawyer said was, okay, so on May 4th, you were on your motorcycle. And I was like, no, it was May 14th. And the lawyer looks down at his notes and he looks over at the judge and the judge is not looking very happy. And the judge says, I have to talk to the counsel for a few minutes, everyone leave. And then the lawyer, the, the crown lawyer comes out and calls me into his office, like don't even go back into the courtroom. And he's like, the judge threw out the ticket because it had the wrong date on it, because it had been apparently mis, miswritten and then he had scratched it out and then he had wrote a four next to it. So he showed me a print of the ticket and in the date field, it was just garbage. I felt kind of dead inside at that point. I, 
I've spent so many months just trying to put on a happy face for everybody, for the kids, for my wife, for work. People pass you in the hallway and they're like, how's the foot? And you're like, it's great. <laughs> it's getting better. But every single footstep is a shot of pain and it doesn't go away. And you thought that this was at least the one thing that was going to go right and it didn't go right at all. It, it was really uh, the crappiest cherry on a really shit cake, sorry. Fully back to normal is never. They tell me it'll be a year to see how far along I get and then after that year it's what I gotta live with. You really start to see how crappy everyone in town is driving. It's terrible. No one actually drives the speed limit. No one pays attention to the yellow light. And it's, it's not just cars, you see like metro buses and school buses just whoosh through. Everyone is trying to get where they've got to go as fast as possible. And it's really scary. Like you just, the, the veneer of society is peeled off after you've had an accident and you're really paying attention to how other people are driving. It's terrible. So given what he's been through, Little is awfully upbeat and he's doing his best to move forward. Now he's still waiting for word from his insurance company, but in the meantime, he's sharing his story to warn others how one moment, one mistake can cause someone else great pain. Reporting for Here and Now, I'm Jeremy Eaton. I do consider myself to be a big fat townie and I have absolutely no qualms about seeing it out loud. Black History Month, CBCNL is marking it, so why isn't the province?
This weather update is brought to you by the NL511 app. No, before you go. Check road conditions, highway cameras, and the provincial plow tracker with the NL511 app. Okay, I feel a bit like a selfish twit because I was going to tell you about all the ice in my driveway and how hard it was on the... You don't like me... Oh, no, it's still, oh, go ahead. <laughs> uh, but there's a much bigger ice problem than uh, my little driveway. Yeah, right? we sh yeah, we showed you guys some pictures yesterday uh, of the Strait of Belle Isle. Let's take mm -hmm. a look at what it looked like this morning. I, there's quite a bit of ice. That's uh, I know it doesn't look like much there, but if I show you the next picture, then you can see uh, just how much. Uh, it looks like there's about 10 to 15 uh, feet of ice and lots of pressure with this. So. It's definitely not good. And if we take a look at uh, the ice from what it was last year and today, you can see it's very similar as far as how much ice is in the straits. And unfortunately, it's just going to get worse over the next little bit. And that's because of these cold temperatures that we've been seeing. Uh, this is where we're sitting right now. So into the minus teens up through Cartwright, St. Anthony. So right in that area, you're looking at temperatures in the minus teens. And as we head through the night tonight, those temperatures are going to get even colder. And another thing to note with this is the wind chill. So Labrador City already down to a wind chill of feeling more like minus 38, minus 28 for Happy Valley Goose Bay. And eventually those uh, cooler temperatures are going to head a little bit further south. So we do have a couple of things in play. We've got an area of low pressure and that cold front that's actually going to bring or is bringing some snow for the island. So things will eventually taper off for the eastern portion of the island and then along the west coast as well as that cold front continues to track a little bit further east. Now in behind it, we get into that onshore flow again, which means some onshore flurries are possible into the overnight could pick up a couple of more centimeters with that. But yesterday's forecast still looking pretty good. Any probably close to 10 centimeters in those higher elevations on the west coast. You're looking at uh, 15 to 20 centimeters through uh, or by the time tomorrow morning rolls around. So Really, it is those temperatures to note do have extreme cold warnings in place for Lab City, Northern Peninsula, and then a special weather statement in effect for the island. And here's where you're going to be sitting temperature wise tonight. Minus 34 for Lab City. Uh, winds are going to stay strong right across the board. You're going to see a shift on the northeast from southwesterlies to northwesterlies, hence those cooler temperatures. So it's going to feel significantly colder as we head through the night tonight. So here's where we'll be sitting overnight into you can see the minus uh, potentially minus 50 close to minus 50 for Lab City. Minus 36 is what it's going to feel like for Happy Valley Goose Bay and then into the minus 20s for the island. Now into tomorrow morning, by the time you're leaving the house, you're certainly going to want to bundle up because wind chills are going to be feeling closer to the minus 30s in the metro area. Minus 19 is what it's going to feel like and then get even worse as we head into the afternoon. And again, it's because those temperatures are really going to drop uh, through the day. So certainly a cold day. If you're planning on heading out, just make sure that you're bundled up because those wind chill values, any exposed skin can freeze in less than 30 minutes. So certainly something to take to take into account. Now, as we head through the day tomorrow, actually going to be a pretty nice day for the most part. We're going to see um, some sun certainly up through Labrador and then peeking out through parts of central, even the Avalon still going to have that potential for some flurries, though, certainly along the west coast, northeast and the south as well. Not ruling that out through the day shouldn't accumulate too much other than on the west coast. Uh, through the day. So here's where you'll be sitting temperature wise. Minus 10 will be the daytime high. You're barely going to get out uh, of those double digit minus double digits. But again, those winds will stay brisk through the afternoon. Heading towards central, a little bit more sunshine in play for Grand Falls, Windsor, minus 15 along the coast, west coast. Those winds will be uh, breezy as well. 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. Those onshore flurries again through the day. So you're probably going to stay pretty cloudy up through the northern peninsula. Another chilly day expected, but plenty of sunshine. Some flurries is possible for Cartwright and we're looking at that as well up through Lab City Happy Valley Goose Bay you're looking at a temperature near minus 17 so that's a look at your Friday cold Friday as we head towards the weekend things will start to get a little better I'll have all those details coming up well February is Black History Month in Canada here in Newfoundland Labrador you won't find anything about Black History Month on the province's website and here in the provincial capital there are no events scheduled to market with an ever-growing population of black Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, we asked three people to share their points of view. I've seen birds give up on flying and like go on the ground and walk across the street. <laughs> yes, bye. When we think about Black History Month, it's, it should be something that we do year long. 
uh, their accomplishments and achievements that black people are doing um, each day of their lives that I think don't necessarily get the attention that they deserve. And I think that Black History Month kind of allows us the opportunity to be able to celebrate those kind of uh, innovations, ideas, um, achievements that people are doing and the contributions that they're actually making to the, to the entire Canada. For me to share with my kids, always I try to share with them about how uh, a lot of uh, black people in Canada, they be a doctor, they have like engineer, we have uh, all these people in our lives, they, they make great, uh, great life for themselves. To be black sometimes, that is, doesn't mean about you different about these people, just that is color of skin. But whole people inside is same color. It's no different, no different inside between any people. Black is a social construct. Black doesn't actually exist. And if we're looking at melanated people here in Newfoundland, I would say that you kind of have four sources. You have immigrants from Africa, you have Afro-Caribbean people, such as myself. You have Black um, or African Americans, Black Americans. And you also have Black Canadians. And so I think that people might see us all as the same on the outside because our skin is beautifully melanated, but we are four different kinds of people. We have four different cultural uh, backgrounds and we don't have any similarities at all so when people say like oh there should be like black people coming together in St. John's and I'm thinking to myself I don't have anything in common with these people <laughs> except the fact that we have to wear a little bit less sunscreen in the summer. This is a critical time and a good opportunity for us to be asking ourselves the critical questions of you know what kind of future do we want for ourselves what kind of um, cultural landscape do we want to develop uh, as a society here and if we're bringing in immigrants and refugees into the into our environment into our spaces you know how do we ensure their full integration and you know contribution within the um, you know social economical and political landscape of Newfoundland and Labrador uh, as a whole some people they ask us this question why you are here for myself, I am here uh, because uh, we're running from our countries to come in Libya. We come in like a refugee. We doesn't have a paper. We doesn't have anything. You know, just people running from war to come into another country. A Libya country, he have like three governments, million of militias. So anyone he have a gun, anyone he can take you from the street because you are black, they can sell to you. They have militias, they sold people from some to another just to go work. If you doesn't want to work, they kill you. And hundreds of people, they died there because just they black. People in my community is so nice. They always love me. I love my kids. Uh, they never looking for us like a black a black person. No, just like looking for us about human. And that is one thing I love it about this place. We never dis uh, feel any dis discrimination or any uh, like something bad. No, I'm so glad because my kids finally they get home. They home to be new Newfoundlander. So I am so lucky. Was that speaking too fast? No. no? Okay. Some snow, I was like, oh, first time you've seen snow, I'll be like, no, bye. Like, yes, bye, some snow out. But uh, now I can speak like <laughs> Newfoundlander, so I guess sometimes I say, yes, bye. So <laughs> I do consider myself to be a Newfoundlander. I do consider myself to be a big fat townie, and I have absolutely no qualms about saying it out loud. It's the end of the line for the Metro bus route. Uh, it's about a 15, 20 minute drive, so it's, it's not walking or biking distance by any means. Servicing CBS, this student says a Metro bus route, well, it just makes sense.
Get beyond the overpass now. Conception Bay South is the second largest region in the metro area, so it may be surprising, but Metro Bus doesn't even stop there. Last weekend, a couple dozen people attended a meeting to talk about extending the bus service. And this afternoon, Carolyn spoke with someone who's in favor of that, definitely in favor of that, a MUN student who lives in Conception Bay South. So here we are in Paradise at the Paradise Ice Arena. It's the end of the line for the Metro Bus route. And if you live in CBS, then uh, this is pretty much as close as you're going to get. And joining me now is Josh Pittman, and you're a MUN student. You live in CBS. Yeah, I do. How far away do you live from this point? It's, uh, it's about a 15, 20 minute drive, so it's it's not walking or biking distance by any means. And I'm not I'm in the middle of CBS, essentially. So there are people in Seal Cove. It takes them probably 45 minutes to get to St. John's. So you drive to school now, but would you prefer it if you could take the bus? Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm lucky to have a vehicle, right? Uh, I have a little bit of disposable income that I can spend 50 bucks a week on a car, but uh, it, it's also very time consuming. So just to drive back and forth. So I, I would I would like the option, right? CBS is a big community spread out among a, a bunch of smaller ones. Uh, and those individual communities, Topsail, uh, Chamberlains, Lompon, they're all a little bit disconnected, but each of them are also disconnected to St. John's, Mount Pearl, and Paradise. Uh, it's very important to me that we be able to access each other's communities and kind of like grow this relationship internally, you know? Okay, so yeah, you live really far away from that bus stop. Yeah, it's a bit more of a hop, skip, and a jump, yeah, for sure. And why would you like the option of using public transit? I think it's a really important public good. Uh, I think a lot of people that live in CBS are isolated from one another. And I think that public transit would allow us to connect our communities and it's a bridge to more activism, mm -hmm. right? Like it allows us to better congregate and come together and organize and uh, uh, try to improve our communities as well, right? And you're a young person going to university, but there are other people I'm sure who would benefit greatly from having public transit, uh, like elderly people, for example. Yeah, so right now the town of CBS subsidizes elderly people and visually impaired people to uh, get taxis from CBS into the health sciences, which is extremely expensive. And several politicians that were at the meeting brought that up. It was just a little community town hall where we tried to do a focused collaborative approach where we brought uh, in residents from all over CBS and tried to get as many people into the room so we could just feel the topic and start building public interest and start getting people to sound ideas off of each other. and But there's a, a, a huge utility value in public transit for people who have mobility issues, have sight issues, or are elderly or unemployed and can't afford a car. Uh, it, it would be beneficial to huge swaths of our community, right? Do you think it would be worth the expense of adding that route to Metro Bus? Well, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. Everyone that was at the meeting, and like I said, that included uh, politicians of the municipal, provincial, and federal level. Uh, it included students, it included parents. Everyone that was there recognized the need for it. And though we don't have all the information on costs, uh, it, it was unambiguously recognized as a really important need for our community. So I think that, you know, barring some kind of astronomical estimate, I think it's an unambiguous good and, and it's definitely needed. Well, you just look at the traffic patterns, you can see there's a need. Anybody else talking about this? Yeah, actually, we reached out to the town of CBS, and uh, we were told that there's a chance this issue could come up at okay. the next town meeting. And for anyone out there, if, if it sounds familiar, this idea of a, a bus route through right. CBS, there actually used to be one. A private uh, bus used to go through CBS. A fleet line went uh, from Holyrood to St. John's years ago. And I spoke with several, pe several people who actually remember uh, that route very fondly for just just two dollars mm -hmm. they could go from CBS to downtown st. John's right so for them it was a very cheap and eco-friendly way to travel but of course the question now is uh, what's the appetite for that kind of route yeah and it wasn't that long ago paradise was lobbying for the same kind of yeah. extended service and all that now and you're not quite it. done tonight uh, last nope. night Carolyn brought you a story about uh, those the family, Mercer food, family. The Mercer, yep. <laughs> a little bit of an update so I uh, will be back with that a little bit later in here now we'll see you then thanks all right, we're going to get to our top story right now. Back to it. Illegal wine shipments and questionable purchases of millions of dollars of wine. Today, the Auditor General released a scathing report that alleges former CEO Steve Winter bought high-end French wine from his son, Greg Winters, wine that the NLC is still struggling to sell. Here's Julia Malali. 
So our audit concluded that the Liquor Corporation did not manage the procurement and sale of specialty wines in an effective manner and in compliance with legislation. We highlighted a number of concerns, uh, particularly with respect to wines managed under what is known as the Bordeaux Futures Program. In particular, the Futures Program was managed outside of the Corporation's standard approved processes. And these processes are always designed with the necessary checks and balances to ensure transactions are appropriate, fair, and transparent. So for example, we found that acquisition decisions regarding the type and quantity of Bordeaux Futures, as well as supplier selection, rested solely with the former CEO. Did not follow the standard process for other product lines, which were managed by NLC's merchandising division, and were not documented or transparent. Similarly, there was no prescribed guidance for the pricing of the Bordeaux Futures wines, which again is inconsistent with the process for other NLC products where there is a documented, approved, and predictable pricing policy. The former CEO generally established the price with reference to certain other relevant information, but overall, the pricing of the wines was not transparent. There was an established practice by the former CEO of purchasing wines under the futures programs in quantities that far exceeded customer demand, resulting in a significant buildup of excess inventory, which reached a high of almost $10 million in 2015. We found there was just really no clear or obvious business rationale to operate the futures program at the inventory levels being procured. Internally, there were concerns with the excess inventory levels, and there were ongoing concerted efforts to reduce this inventory through significant price discounts, selling the wine locally, internationally, to liquor authorities in other provinces, and to individuals and customers in other provinces. We also found that NLC contravened federal and provincial legislation by knowingly selling and shipping or arranging the shipping of specialty wines directly to customers in other provinces. Again, most of these wines were discounted and often had price overrides applied at the point of sale, and that was all in an effort to reduce the excess levels of specialty wine. At the end of our audit period in April of 2019, there was still Bordeaux wine inventory of $5.4 million, with a provision for a write-down of that inventory of $1.3 million. This inventory included an estimated 42,000 bottles of wine with an average cost, so not retail, but cost, of 128 per bottle, and over 2,000 of the bottles having a cost ranging from 500 to over 3,400. We also identified that the former CEO did not take appropriate action to address a known conflict of interest relationship with a close family member who conducted business with NLC. The audit found that the former CEO made decisions to purchase certain specialty wines which benefited the close family member and which, in our view, influenced the performance of the CEO's duties as a public office holder.
was quite cold out today here in St. John's, but that didn't stop some elementary school kids from getting outside to raise a flag. All right, here we go. I want to hear you cheer. Well, St. Andrews Elementary has been flying a pride flag for years, but all the wind and winter weather shredded and tore the old flag. So the school approached St. John's Pride about getting a new one, and they showed up with that flag, and school staff, pride members, and the students, they gathered outside to hoist that brand new rainbow. We've always had it here at St. Andrews to represent all of our students. So, uh, of course, when a flag gets tattered, you want to be able to replace it to be respectful of what it represents. So that's what we did. We gave them a call and sure enough, they were there to help us out. I mean, it's absolute positivity. You know, anytime you get an opportunity to come into the community and uh, help represent everybody, I think it's a fantastic thing. So we were certainly very pleased when uh, St. Andrews uh, gave us a call. One of the goals at St. Andrews is that all of our kids feel welcomed and safe in a very inclusive building. So representing, uh, um, the pride flag and having it flown every day at St. Andrews, it certainly adds to this accepting, loving environment that's very important in our school. The Canadian International Auto Show is about to get underway in Toronto. It's an event that draws an average of 300,000 visitors. And at that show, Canadians can see the future of cars, but few are ready to embrace it. Here's the CBC's Peter Armstrong. In a lot of ways, auto shows are a glimpse into the future to see what cars some point down the road are going to look like. Autonomous cars like this one, electric cars. But they're also a really good glimpse into what's actually happening right now in the auto industry. Because right now, most consumers are still worried about the price of electric cars, about the range of electric cars. Automakers aren't making nearly enough of them to keep up with the meager demand. It's still less than 3% of cars sold. And government regulations seemingly ever-changing complicate that picture even further. And right now, because in part of a lot of that, that is what's selling in Canada. 75% of vehicles sold in Canada last year are crossovers and SUVs, very traditional cars. And it gives you a sense that even though we can see what the future may look like, that path towards it is still a very long road. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. Well, same with national news, protests in support of wetsuit and chiefs are legal in Canada. Impeding the movement of trucks, cars, trains, and people going to work in government offices is not. The situation is, in the words of Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller, volatile. And he's asked to meet with Mohawks camped near a rail line to try to find a solution. The government of B.C. has agreed to meet with chiefs at the heart of the dispute, but simmering frustrations remain from CN, shippers, travellers, about how they're being portrayed in the standoff. We're not stopping until you stop. So when you have politicians, your colonial politicians like Mark Miller, turning the situation around like as if we're the ones that are being violent kikinaskin you are lying you're manipulating you're turning the situation around you're gaslighting us uh, mohawks in the tayen denega rail standoff are still weighing whether to meet with minister mark miller ontario superior court issued an injunction last week barring continued interference with those rail operations but the ontario provincial police have not so far enforced that injunction there have been at least four other areas in canada where rail lines have been affected by protests the one in southern manitoba came to an end today we're from newfoundland and labrador a little town called orwood a musical farewell from the Mercer family on CBC's Family Feud.
The weather update is brought to you by Belltone, your partner in better hearing. No doubt feeling a little colder and uh, looking at the temperatures in the big land, not that much <laughs> colder. Wow, big wind chills and mm -hmm. unbelievable. So as we look to Saturday, how, how long is it going to stay cold? Yeah, yeah. so we're going to, yeah, we're going to see these uh, chilly temperatures stick around for a little bit, okay. at least through the first half of the weekend. So let's take a look at what's going to happen. Uh, there's that cold air in those pinks. So as we head through the night tonight, that's going to start to dip down, certainly for the big land and then eventually for the island as well as we head through the day on Friday. Now that cold air will stick around into Saturday afternoon as well, but then we should actually start to see some relief. The cold air will retreat back a little bit further north and allow some of those temperatures to uh, head back towards seasonal for uh, the island, but you're still going to stay pretty chilly up through Labrador. So here's where you'll be sitting Saturday afternoon. Not a whole lot happening weather wise, just some flurries moving through uh, Lab City, minus 18, minus 19 for Happy Valley Goose Bay, plenty of sunshine. Again, that onshore flow expected to continue along the west coast. So you're still looking at the chance of flurries as well. But again, temperatures recovering slightly, uh, anywhere from five to seven degrees for parts of the uh, Avalon or uh, the island. Rather, Grand Falls winter winds are sitting at minus eight, and then St. John's still looking at that chance of flurry, some sunshine in the mix as well, looking at minus seven. So. Looking ahead, uh, we are going to stay in that pattern again Saturday night into Mon uh, into Sunday. So still looking at that potential for some flurries up through the big land as well as onshore flurries for the west coast. Even the south coast, you're going to see some as well. It's going to stay generally unsettled through the day on uh, Monday as well as the next system rolls in. And this one's going to bring a little bit of a mess for parts of eastern Newfoundland. Uh, some snow, it looks like, towards central, but anything east of the... Um, essentially the Avalon, you're looking at rain and then eventually changing over to snow again as that system moves quite quickly through though. And then Tuesday, a little bit of relief and then the next one rolls in. So we are in another active pattern. Unfortunately, it's going to be one storm after another. And at this point, it looks like most of the action or at least the changeover will be for parts of eastern Newfoundland staying as snow up through Labrador. So here's where you'll be sitting over the next five days, a uh, roller coaster of temperatures. So after uh, tomorrow, we'll slowly climb up above zero. There's uh, that two degrees on Monday, hence why we're going to see that changeover and then drop like a rock again on Tuesday. Down to minus 11 is your overnight lows. For central Newfoundland, sunshine uh, through Saturday and then into the gray skies to finish off the weekend. But your temperatures will be hovering a little bit below seasonal into the minus single digits. Now for western Newfoundland, you're looking at essentially onshore flurries right through Monday, Tuesday, a little bit of, peak of some peaks of sun in minus five and then up through eastern Labrador flurries tomorrow and then quiet temperatures will rebound a little bit as we head into Sunday and then drop again for both Monday and Tuesday and then for western Labrador you're looking at flurries basically through Sunday temperatures will finally recover though but then drop again for Monday at minus 17 so when I come back I will have a look at your weather photo but survey says it's time for Carolyn <laughs> Thanks, Ashley. Great segue because of this next story. The Mercer family from Holy from Horwood rather didn't have as much luck on last night's family feud as they had hoped. Here and now spoke with them yesterday after they won ten thousand dollars. Now they didn't make it to the final round last night, but they did sing a special song for host Jerry D in their final appearance. Here are some highlights. <laughs> Oh, oh I, love it. Fight. I want to fight. You. Fight. I know fight. you are. Fight, 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 fight. 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 You know what he fight. said to me? Fight. What he I say told to him I was single. And he says, and then I says, oh, Percy, go sit down. <laughs> he says, no wonder you're single. <laughs> I was only joking. No, you weren't. Yes, I was. <laughs> I'm going to sleep. <laughs> now we're going. First fight. I'm too old for her, anyways. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> yeah, he is. You <laughs> <laughs> need an online date for the first time, but it's clear they've lied about their blank in their profile, Dale. Their marital status. Is that true? Yes, it is. How do you know that? <laughs> Friends of mine told me. It is! We're from Newfoundland and Labrador, a little town called Orwood. 
There are 12 of us in family, and times were up to no good. We'd like to thank CBC for a chance to play the feud. And give to me Jerry D, cause he's a real cool dude. great was that? Oh, what a hard act to follow. <laughs> it's a real, actually not really. Look at this beautiful shot there. It's pretty. I think that's absolutely gorgeous. I'll tell you where this is too when we come back. In Newfoundland and Labrador, more people than ever before are struggling to put food on the table. You're like, okay, gotta get home, feed the kids. What am I gonna make for them? Do I have the ingredients I need? If I don't have the ingredients, do I have enough money to go buy them? Single parent households are most likely to suffer. And when you have to choose between paying the bills and food, food usually comes near the end. CBCNL presents Fed Up, a series looking into why so many people are experiencing food insecurity. For more details, head to cbc.ca slash nl. Okay, so not that much time left. Should we go right to the photo? We should. Okay, let's beautiful. take a look. Look at that beautiful shot. I just love when the clouds play The trees give it the away. Sun. There Do we they? go. Yeah, well, oh. at least... Well, I didn't think it would. Not that specifically. <laughs> oh, yes, that's the rigolette tree. That no. is the rigolette. No, yeah. of course not. Beautiful shot there. Uh, yeah, cloudy rigolette sunrise. Len Bennett uh, sent us that gorgeous shot. Thank you so much for sending that in. And if you have any weather photos to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Mm -hmm. Went and back to the sunset, yeah. sunrises. I can't blame. Enough cats and dogs. That's right. Uh, pretty cold, too. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah, just make sure when you're uh, leaving the house tomorrow morning that you're all bundled up, you and the kids, because going to be chilly. It's going to drop again. Yeah. All right, Thursday already, uh, Friday tomorrow, of course. Mm -hmm. We'll see you as we head into the weekend. Good night.